All right, welcome back to the Whiskey and Business Podcast. And I have a special guest. This is Jonathan Retaldis. He owns Organics Pest Control out here locally. Um, and he also does a lot of amazing stuff in terms of growing business, his business, uh, you know, motivational wise. And we're going to get into a lot of stuff dealing with how he got into business and everything like that. But first, we have um, a special whiskey. This is a this is a rye from Michter's. Very hard to get. And if you're in the area, um, at the Rack Tier Lounge, they do have plenty of these hard to get Michter's rye. Um, so what's up, dude? What's up, man? How have you been? Good. Um, so let's try this out. It's, at the end, we'll review it, so don't uh, give away any, okay. you know, first time <laughs> sippers. So, cheers, man. Mmm. Okay. I'm not a, I'm not usually a rye person, so rye you know, always rye. kind of kick on me pretty yeah. hard um, than bourbon does. <clears throat> and this is a, uh, this is pretty good so far. So you're a big whiskey guy, though, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm not a big cigar guy, so a lot of these episodes, it's more Travis and Paul. Uh, they talk about the cigars. I don't know anything really about cigars, so um, th no, we don't have them this week's um, on this week's podcast. So we're just going to kind of talk about the whiskey a little bit more, and uh, Paul in the background gave us um, a good pairing, so um, just ask Paul for that specific one at the end, in the episode. So, so I want to start off by... So you own Organics Pest Control, mm -hmm. and it started with Captar in the past, wow. and you rebranded. So how did like you three times? Why? And then give me the process of how difficult it was to rebrand from starting at Captar to Organics. So I would argue that it's not that difficult if you do it early in the process, right? So like let's say if Coke had a rebrand, oh, it would yeah. be a fucking of problem, okay? Yeah. So little old me uh, having to rebrand my small pest control company uh, was not that difficult. Right. Um, I just, you have to kind of have guts to do it and you have to have guts to real, like you have to, under, you have to have an understanding when you're wrong. Mm -hmm. That's really big. So what was the decision that made you go from Captar to organic? No, fucking, no one knows what Captar is, right? They think I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's not exactly a very um, easily brandable name, right? Like no one understands what it is. It doesn't stand for anything. It's just there. Um, it was more of an inside joke. I had a couple of buddies on Discord which playing video games and all that, mm -hmm. and uh, forget what game we were playing. Um, and we had this little clan called the Rat Pack. Okay. Right. So again, that was probably about a year before I started this particular business venture, and uh, it's like, well, that's cool. Rat Pack spelled back. Okay. Yeah, oh, there you go, some good cap. So it was an inside joke, right? Yeah. Uh, but in all reality, if you're going to scale something, uh, obviously, Name isn't everything, but because uh, you can, you can get up to a mil, even multi mil, uh, million dollars, with a shitty name and shitty branding, as long as you understand direct response money. Right. Very. It's not exactly that difficult to do. Um, but if you want to scale past that, um, at that point, I would argue branding becomes a lot more important. Right. Um, and same thing with certain marketing. Direct response is still incredibly important. Mm -hmm. uh, but at that point, the brand becomes a lot more of a key feature, uh, even locally. Right. So like. Uh, I think, locally, I, mean, I, have, I think locally is most important. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, let's take two examples, right? So, I'm from Spokane. Um, and uh, even when I was younger, too, I think I drove a Mitsubishi Lancer at the time. I got uh, rear-ended by someone. Um, and the first person I thought about, because I saw it on the billboards, and I heard it on the radio, and the fuckers everywhere, okay, is mm -hmm. Frank's walk. Right. The the let's call Saul Spokane. <laughs> That's all I fucking. Get. He's his his ugly mug is fucking on the. Uh, he's now like encroaching into Idaho. We're almost like on the border, on the border. because every time we go back and forth through uh, uh, on, Idaho, on freeway, yeah, 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 you see his ugly no big old red one. Big old his face is on there. Well, five star, yeah, it's, yeah. So anyway, so we have. Sleazy lawyer, but that's the only one I can think of. Right. That's Brandon, right? That's not just me typing into Google, like, uh, accident lawyer right. or whatever. Um, I already know it. The one call, that's all. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like, like, A lot of people know it. That's the branding. That's what I mean. Um, and then here locally um, in Idaho, for example, even more a uh, smaller example of that would be Bill's uh, heating and cooling. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? So, like, you see all their trucks everywhere. They do a lot of new builds. 
Um, I'm not exactly sure what their requirement is for their technicians, if, if right. that's all their own vehicles and whatnot, but I see their stuff everywhere. Mm -hmm. They're on the billboards. So like locally, right, when, when someone has, their quality might be shit. I've never used them, but they might be good too. Right. But I know them. You know what I mean? I actually have a really they're good, everywhere. Yeah. They got a good name I too. I have a really good buddy that owns uh, um, an HVAC company. He did my uh, my condensing unit. He replaced my furnace uh, last year. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, you know, he's a good friend. Um, he does good work and I use him. But in my head, right, I still have bills. I actually remember bills more than I remember his company. Right. Even though I would argue he does better work. Right. But like I said, yeah. that, it's that the over branding over time. Yeah, that's crazy. That, see, that's pretty cool. That, so that's what made me uh, the shift from Cap to where no one, it was Cap Art Pest Control at the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, I rebranded to Capture Environmental because um, we were all we were always going for uh, eco-friendly pest products or botanicals or stuff that has. Uh, like I'm assuming you follow the trend of eco-friendly. Exactly. It's a huge movement. Everybody's people wanting, organic, dude. Yep. Like you know what I mean. So, and ha why not better organics pest control? Yeah. yeah. Now, did you choose the? Instead of organic, spelt the normal way. Did you do you have to spell it with with the yes. X? So not really. I mean, like if you take a look at one of the biggest brands, Pest Control, for example, uh, one of them uh, would be like Trimax, right? mm -hmm. with an X. Uh, it was just more of a play on words than anything. Um, and granted, probably the CS could do really well. As they, they, I, arguably, I think the X looks better as, I mean, as the name, bit, yeah. like than just organic spelt the, the right way. I think. I think the X kind of makes the logo pop a little bit more. Yeah. So I mean, there's that. Uh, you know, maybe we lose a little bit and in, in, in a negligible negligible percentage of like clicks or whatever when people type in organic pest control. But right. but our keyword, for example, is pretty close. Mm -hmm. So so we're definitely going to get. Oh, plus the back end stuff kind of takes care of that too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. We're not spelling organic organics on the copy, just the name. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot you can do on the back end that will help you rank better. So then, when you switch to that, right? What? How? How hard was it to once you rebranded? You found the logo. You got all that stuff going. Changed all your stuff online. Oh, what? How? What was the process of what? Like the moment you changed it, like of t trying to educate the user base again. That, no, no, I'm I'm still captain. Did you have to like? No, not really. I was small enough to where that part doesn't didn't really matter as much. I mean, we only really started gaining significant momentum. I would argue over the last year. Okay. And that change was done before that. Right. Um, well, right around then. Mm. Um, so, so I think when I met you, a long like the first time I met you, you were still Captar, but you were in the process, mm -hmm. and that was like two years ago, probably around, around there. Yeah. Um, so then when you so you didn't really have to go through any of the growing pains of like you just rebranded. Now everybody has to figure you out again. You were just like. It was just smooth sailing once you once you switched and you just kind of doubled down on it. Yeah, so I have a. Uh, I'm weird. Uh, like I tend to throw things against the wall, mm -hmm. kind of see what sticks. But I really do my best to not, you know, die on that hill. Right. Right. So like, I, I figure you know making mistakes is 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 life, and it's going to happen to everybody, and you're going to make a ton of them. Right. But if you're just on the right general path just the gen you don't have to be precise with it but if you're kind of taking steps in the right direction i would argue that that's more important than getting everything perfect mm -hmm. so even the even the even starting i mean mistake. nobody can even get it perfect in the first place it's fucking possible you know? that's why most people don't start anything right they, just, they, they want to be perfect they want this perfect moment to do everything it's like that's never gonna happen you just yeah. fucking do it same thing with having kids <laughs> it's just, it just gotta happen too i guess yeah <laughs> you can't really plan for that shit no <laughs> Not really. You know, but I, I think I think that's a no good philosophy about it, though. Yeah. No one ever told me how hard the first six months was. And and by the way, it's not even not even me bitching about it, okay? Like, my wife took a brunt of that day, dude. Like, and it's going to happen again. Because uh, your second kid's due soon. Very. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, I mean, I like the philosophy behind it, though. It's like just throwing stuff on the wall and see what sticks. Uh, but you're also doing it with caution a little bit like you they're good educated throws to the wall in a way you know? um and I, I i would say that the key the big thing to that is not over committing resources to those ideas that you're throwing against the wall mm -hmm. uh jeff bezos did this mm -hmm. 
Uh, for example, uh, I'm not entirely sure because it's been a while since I even looked into it. Um, but when they released the Fire Phone, I think that was like a $200 million flop, more or less. I, I don't quote me on the numbers, but mm -hmm. it, was, it was a significant sum at the time. Um, and Bezos, man, he just said, fuck, we're going to make mistakes. Um, we're probably going to keep making mistakes. But that's kind of Amazon demo. Um, they're a company in which they throw a lot against the wall. Mm -hmm. um, and again, they see what sticks. The thing is, they uh, they cut the weeds and water the flowers. So if something is beginning to gain traction, or if they think it's going, if they think it's a solid project, they don't they don't put all their eggs in one basket on that one. But uh, right. they'll fund it. Um, so they start small, they kind of plant these seeds, and then as these trees start growing, um, the ones that are producing fruit, I guess I would argue, that mm -hmm. those are the ones that, that receive more water, more right. capital, more resources, more people right. um, on those projects. I mean, that's how you had AWS come out. You know, I they know. fucking had no idea. No. The a lot cloud that, computing. A lot of that spaghetti code, dude. That, that so they, it was originally, uh, it was for them, right? Right. And so, and his fucking wisdom against probably a lot of people kind of in that circle, you know, he decided to say that we're going to pretty much give free access yeah. to to everybody, so you can develop, you can do all sorts of stuff, and you can use their stuff and they'll rent it for you for cheap and you could actually even as an entrepreneur right now if you have any sort of technical ability um, you don't need to buy your you don't need to you know storage or servers right you don't need to buy all that Cloud, you can, rent it, from Google, you can it. rent it from Amazon there are people out there that for cheap that the value that they're giving you you're, you're underpaying for the value that they're giving right oh 100%. So anyways, uh, that whole AWS thing or Kind of the cloud stuff that's going on right mm -hmm. now, and, and you have these three big players, at least in the states, you have like Microsoft, Google, and Amazon. Yep. Kind of a three horse race on that. Yep. Um, you know, they're willing to to sell you and rent you this. Their kind of value that they're giving. Yep. So, and all they did was stuff that was stuck into the wall. That's man. and that's what happens. And uh, Nassim Taleb talks about it too when it comes to uh, even you know almost on a macro level. Right. Uh, a lot of so let's say, I forget how many businesses, multiple thousands, I'm not terribly sure, um, mm -hmm. were opened up, for example, this last year, mm -hmm. um, or free or whatever. Right. Um, a lot of those are gonna fail. Uh, a ton of them won't, right. statistically speaking. Right. Uh, but the thing is, it makes the, the, the unit as a whole, so let's say we take our, let's say US economy, for example, not even global, but the US. Um, those little minor fractures and failures get fixed up. Almost like, and I'm not like a lifter by any means or anything like that, but that's kind of how muscles are built, you know, mm -hmm. right? So like stress, stress tears and all that shit, and then over time your body gets it. Mm -hmm. um, but let's say, you know, you jump off a, a 10 story building, there's no fixing that, man. You're, you're gonna fuck that. Right. Um, so that's the thing. Uh, these little, these businesses going out of business and in, in, in these different verticals, um, they make the whole system as a whole stronger. So I'd argue that too much centralization, in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, and granted, I haven't gone deep enough as I probably should have to even go into this topic, but um, you know, there's a ton of people way smarter than me that have, and, and this is so mm -hmm. far kind of me just kind of looking at what they've written and, and kind of makes sense in a way. Right. But we'll, again, make that unit stronger as a whole. Yeah. So like, the business owners that, or these businesses that survive all these other ones dying, uh, they'll learn from that. Right. And uh, are likely to improve. And so the ones that are left standing are likely to be better businesses, are able to offer the customer more value, right. uh, et cetera. Uh, yeah. Which, again, makes the whole system. Sure. And you don't know until you try. Like, that's the whole thing. So the customer is a lot more important than what's in your head. Right. Uh, Melissa Bride talked about that. Um, I think it was in one of his recent talks, two or three talks ago, not yeah. terribly sure which one, but. Uh, you know, as an entrepreneur, uh, what's in your little brain is, you know, it's important. You might have a good uh, original idea. Mm -hmm. um, but until the customer has a say. You got to What's up, dude? Oh, you're late. Travis. Wait, what? Travis is late today, dude. What happened? You started without me? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, we did. Yeah, it's just, sorry, dude. You're, you're, in oh, well, yeah. you're in the crowd now. You're in the crowd now, so. Like Travis, just wait for the camera and then. Like, yeah, there you go. Just walk right in front of it. 
along. Let's get this picture. Yeah. You can be the you can be the audience, and we'll just you just clap when like cool things, and you go ah like sad parts. Uh, well, that, that's for like endearing parts. Yeah, yeah. Oh, like, the boo oh. to sad parts. Or... Boo. <laughs> there are some endearing parts. There are some endearing. Can parts. kids' daughters do one party. Oh. Oh, there you go. <laughs> but yeah, dude, I mean, oh, uh, yeah. like two days. Uh, so like, let's pivot off of like, so what do you do on a daily basis? Like, because you had this notebook that was, you're, you tell me off camera about this, like, like organization, motivation, like what are like little tips that people can do, mindset stuff, um, keep them on task, you know, when they open a business, I know it's stressful. And a big reason people fail is because of all the little minor things they're not doing because they're just focused, they're like dead set focused on like one little increment, increment part of their business. They're not looking at the full, the full circle of what they need. What do you do to kind of keep on task, keep organized, motivational, and, and have motivation? Yeah, that's a lot to unpack. Yeah, um, yeah we're going to have to do this kind of one at a time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, start with the organization. Organization. Okay, so um, I think it's different for person. Mm -hmm. I think there's no one size fits all answer to that. Um, I think some people just genetically or you know they're more predisposed to be more organized than mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a book and I forget the author. It's called The Perfect Mess, and it kind of goes into that when it comes to like dirty presentations and clean presentations and how certain businesses, even with more of a dirty exterior or, or whatever. Um, yeah, I don't need to go into that specifically, but um, I just think it's more, I think it's more, uh, you know, for, it's more to the individual. Um, and me, for example, I kind of go, you know, Warren Buffett talks about the, the importance or just having the ability to have an empty calendar um, can tend to free up your headspace a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and so like Warren Buffett, uh, Munger, arguably, um, Modus Cabrai, guys, we are a lot of these guys that I look up to um, a lot. Uh, they're like some of my favorite people in the world. Um, they they keep an empty counter. Now, it might not be an original idea to Modus Cabrai, for example, but my man is Shane So uh, that's one of the reasons why he's one of my favorite investors. He's not afraid of popping good ideas. And that's what a lot of people, uh, I think, are afraid to do. Uh, I think that's one of the most important things that you it's, it's, it's something that can give you an incredible advantage. Um, copying a good idea is incredibly important. None of my ideas, not a single one so far, uh, was original. I think I fucking came up with pest control as a business. Right. You know, like, this shit's been around forever. Right. Uh, there's so much free information out there. You can learn a ton. Where was the number one thing you went and found free information on? Was it YouTube? YouTube was huge. Uh, reading. Uh, now it's not necessarily free, but uh, it's almost free, right? right? So like you can spend 20, 80 bucks on a book. You can get a million dollars worth of value out of that book. One little nugget, you know, could save you a ton of money down the road, mm -hmm. or could make you a ton of money over time. That one little thing. So half the YouTube and half the books kind so, of kept you on the educational like mm -hmm. learning. Yeah. So I mean. I did a lot of long form stuff, uh, like CEO interviews, learning from guys that have kind of been through it, not just academics that are theorizing about it. Um, I feel like it's, it's, it's a better bet for most people okay. uh, and reading. Uh, and there's a lot of resources out there now that weren't around 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, Audible is one. Yeah. So like even if you're- That's what I use. Yeah, even if you're- I, I, I can't sit and read books. I have to listen to them. So I do both. I, I mostly read. I do standard books. My Kindle's loaded with a ton of books. Um, and then I also do Audible as well. What's nice about American Express though, um, is they actually cover my Audible subscription. So I get two credits and like a bunch of their library and it's just covered by Phoenix, which nice. is pretty sweet. Okay. Um, and then, uh, yeah, reading is important. I mean, this year, we're almost to the end of the year and it's been a slower year for me. Um, probably 50, 60 bucks. Maybe I try nice. to get up to 100. Right. Um, it's not just reading. Uh, like let's say Audible is credits a month. Mm -hmm. I normally don't buy a digital books off of Audible because I tend to read a little 
quite a bit faster than what Audible, the narration on Audible does. Right. Um, but it's really handy to have um, if, let's say, I'm trying to get through something or if I'm on a road trip or whatever, you're driving to Seattle, you know, it's a six hour drive or whatever. Like, mm -hmm. you can get through most of it. It's 50% of books, or like seven hours on there. Um, right. Or let's say if you're going there and back, that's like 12 hours. Some, some bigger books are 15 or whatever. You can get through quite a bit. <laughs> Excuse me. So, you can kind of mix the two. Mm -hmm. So you can do Kindle, you can do, I, I actually prefer, like I really like the feel of the books. Right. I, I kind of like normal pens. I have a tablet I do a ton of work on, but mm -hmm. uh, same thing with this this journal or this uh, notebook, for example. I, I try to mix what I prefer, which would be like normal pen and paper, right. with tech. So this allows me to like scan the page and shoot into my Google Drive and everything like that. And it lets me like write normal notes, like a, you know, the typing's okay, but I, I just right. kind of I shit handwriting, but I can read it. I think know? having like, I think having physical notes, there's just something about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's just more people went online because it's like, well, you can go and grab your notes later on, like it's not yeah. on paper, so it's, yeah. you're not risking anything getting right. lost or whatever. But as like, a business owner, you you like to find little techie stuff, and this is like techie paper. So, yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, so it's like waterproof paper. Um, the pen ink dries in like ten seconds, so it will smear if you like do it right away. Mm -hmm. But like, that's not going anywhere, right? And so, you can have multiple drives, which let's say you ever know. Google Drive or whatever your, your service is for that. Right. Um, I don't know if they're integrated with Notion yet or not, but you just scan it. Use their app, you scan it, it goes straight into where you, and, and then you you write the symbol on it and then it goes directly to whichever thing right. you have. So like if I'm doing a thesis, uh, you know, on a stock idea, I try to boil it down into one. Right. And if I can't explain why I'm buying a company um, to a, sixth grader right. in a paragraph or a few sentences, I probably don't understand that idea enough to be, to warrant a purchase, right? right? So that's what I try to do. Uh, I do, you know. So you put your thoughts on paper, you put your thoughts out there on paper, you're organized that way where now you can stock these your own way where you have it written down, you put them, then you scan to your Google Drive, erase it all, start over. Uh, what what motive, like, but besides the organization stuff, what motivates you to keep going as a business owner? Because I know there's tons and tons of hard, like hard times. Everybody's got their lows. Like it's not easy. Like you almost don't breeze all the time. But like, what motivates you to just keep progressing? I guess. Oh man. So the thing about motivation, I I, I think it's a bit overrated. Mm -hmm. um, probably really big overrated. Um, if, if you need external motivation in your business to, to move on and to carry forward and to go through the hard shit, um, you know, maybe being an entrepreneur is probably, entrepreneur is probably not for you. Mm -hmm. um, but it also comes to, I mean, what what are you doing? Do you like the business that you're in? As Warren Buffett says he half dances to work every day. That's one way to keep your motivation up. If you're in something you hate, I, I, I argue that you're not going to be able to muster up the willpower and the, the motivation, quote unquote, to really push through the hard times. Or you might chug along, but I don't think you'll like thrive. You right. know, you might fucking hate your life in 10, 15 years. And, you, and so organics, that's a business you chose that you like? Uh, not necessarily um, in a way, but it's a business that I really like the economics of. Gotcha. You don't have to necessarily like, yeah, you know, like wants, doing yeah. spraying, spraying bugs, or right? Whatever, right? Yeah. I mean, like not like, but like the business model and all. Yeah, I, I think the economics are good. There's a lot. There's other businesses that we're getting into that I find the economics to be attractive, um, and that we'll continue to pursue. But again, those are businesses that. How would I put it? Uh, those are businesses again that have a track record. So mm -hmm. high return on equity or is it the which excites you? Return. Yeah. So like you have to make money. Uh, if you're not making money, I'd argue that you need to make money right. before you do something that you're not going to make money. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, because at that point it becomes almost like a crutch, like a rut you, that you can't get out. Of. Gotcha. And as soon as you're reliant on whatever tiny amount of income that whatever you're doing is producing, it, it becomes a little difficult to do what you want to do. Right. Okay. So not necessarily what motivate you're you're more motivated on 
the idea of the business and the, and the economics of the business. Dude, I just want to have like a fucking art gallery of just kick-ass businesses. <laughs> that's that's like you walk into this this museum, okay, and every business that you own is like a Mona Lisa. You know what I mean? Like you love it. It's profitable, uh -huh. does well, has good growth potential, long runway. Uh, that's kind of that's kind of what I look for. And okay. these businesses that maybe be that, that might be unattractive to people as a whole, you know, uh, like a dirty job, but they, for example, really but they produce results. a lot, or they're kind of they're unloved little gems. Gotcha. But uh, they're gems, right? right. So like. Find a fucking diamond in a shit pile. Right. Like everyone thinks shit, but there's a diamond in there. Right. You know, uh, that's kind of what I like because it limits your competition. I don't fucking want to compete with all like these FBAs. I want to go to Facebook or some shit. Like no way, dude. I want to. I want to compete with Chuck and Chuck types. Like, I like that. Yeah, I like that. You know, competition's a deadly force, man. Capitalism is very brutal, and right. people would argue that capital or uh, the competition isn't important. It's very important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Competition drives down prices and, and, and compresses margins. Is yep. What it does, and it happens to every fucking business. Right. The only reason some people don't notice it so much is because their business is too small. Well, they, have, they haven't gone into into the competition. That's market. what I mean. So they're 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 a really really tiny fish, and any market share that they take or any new customers that they get is all it's all it's kind of adding, right? So, you know, let's say if they're sub two hundred thousand dollars, like anything at that point is is is. From their perspective, is very positive. Right. Kind of is in a way. And once Plus, starts, if they're already in, if they're in the sub, in, if they're in a low income stage in the business, generally speaking, they're already undercutting the entire market just to solidify the business, like because they haven't actually gone enough where they can like turn people down and they can actually gotten to that like this is the price I want to charge because I'm worth it. Yeah. They're usually just charging like dirt cheap. So that's that's something that's pretty common. The big issue with that is it's going to be very hard to scale, um, especially if they build a client's own reputation around the experience. Um, it's going to be very hard. Yep. Uh, you might get to a point where you can keep the lights on long term, but it's probably not going to be a very profitable venture for you. Or fun. You do that, or fun. Uh, it might be more, like, more volume, more problems. Now, if you're like a Walmart, right, or if your model is built on volume, and I would argue that 99% of people that go into business, that's not their model. Right. And that's not something that they should focus on. It can work very well. Uh, but you need scale. You're not at scale at a million in revenue, okay? Right. You're not at scale at five million in revenue, dude. You're local. Like the fucking plumber, dude, that's been around for ten years. He's he's at that level. He, well, if he's if he has a couple of employees. Right. But like that's not scale. Once you start hitting scale, is when it becomes a lot more important. Right. And that's again when direct response is still important. But I would argue that the brand now, for people that don't know direct response. What do you mean by that? Because uh, there's going to be some people that don't probably understand the direct response aspect. Yeah, so like, let's say you go to Google and you search in uh, window cleaner near me or oil change near me, like your own maps or whatever, or even let's say, for example, my business, or one of my businesses so has control near me. Right. The businesses that pop up on top, besides organic search, are paid. Right. And so that would be considered, you know, direct response marketing. You would have something that the business has to offer. You type that something into more of a, into a platform right. or to a middleman, let's say Google or Facebook. Facebook is, I would, let's just stick with Google. Yeah. Um, you type that into Google and it provides you with the businesses that can actually do whatever they need to yeah. So that would be more direct. So in context, basically just Google ads. Yep. Um, Google ads. For the most part. Uh, there's a lot of other uh, pay per click advertising for direct response, stuff like that on other platforms. And yeah, Facebook, one of them is just a little bit more cliche. Yeah. A lot more to unpack in that. Uh, we'll go into that in a different episode. But so, direct response, which means just basically putting your putting your business in front of somebody. Yeah, exactly. Just paying someone to get your name. Okay. And then so, when the businesses are profitable, like like, because usually when you first start out, right? There's a lot of fucking shit to unpack of of your business, like. You know your CRM, how you, how, you, how how the public sees you, your webs, your your how you go online. Like there's so much shit. But like, what made what? How did you scale your business to where it is now? With all that, like, did you automatically start off with knowing everything that you needed to do, 
not 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 specifically the rebrand, just like when you like even past after like how did you start that one out? Did you did you did you just throw it on the wall to see if it sticks? And then just started with just getting the name and then getting one van or like like did you did you fully plan that out? Like No. So I understood that the economics worked well. Um, I would argue it's very hard to see this week. I think most people that say they could predict things are either lying. To, and by predicting, I don't really see in the future. I mean by like having a a direction on where the economy is going or where interest rates are going right. or whatever. Like right now, that could be a pretty interesting topic with inflation being a little hot and, and right. increasing rates. So, I mean, you can have all the assumptions that you want. doesn't mean you're going to be right. I think uh, probability trees are important, you know. But then again, it's all it's all what's baked into the assumptions. And that's mm -hmm. what's interesting. And, and, and again, to go back to the whole calf garden thing or whatever, you think I fucking saw the future when I, <laughs> when I started that? <laughs> no, I didn't. Um, and most people, again, that's why when you and I talked about, like, the whole millionaire thing or the multimillionaire thing, there's a fucking ton of millionaires that don't know what the fuck they're doing. You know, they, they kind of got lucky, and, and I, I, I'm very honest in that sense of the term, but they got lucky. For example, I got lucky. Uh, most millionaires got lucky. Yeah. It becomes a lot harder to be lucky to get to that billion in that worth. Of course, yeah. So, a thousand, a thousand? Yep. Yeah, a thousand. <laughs> yep. So, that's a lot harder to do than one million. Yeah, right. so it's a lot harder to do than 10, it's a lot harder to do than 100. Um, a lot of guys that are between that one to 10 million mark, uh, they probably have a lot of beliefs that aren't exactly um, which beneficial. Right. Um, and, and the issue with a lot of those guys is, you know, they're the ones that will be writing books or whatever, or giving advice or selling a fucking course on YouTube or something like that. Um, and the thing is, the best way I can put it is, is Buffett talks about this coin slipping contest. Mm -hmm. Let's say you have a thousand coin flippers, okay, and they each have a million dollars, and when they get heads, they win, they get a million dollars, right? So, but it cuts the entire pool down by half. So you get a thousand, cuts it down, flip coin, you win. 500. Flip coin, you win. Keep it. Flip coin, you go all the way down the line. Mm -hmm. So once you start getting to like 50 people flipping them coins, they're what? I forget how many millions they have. Yeah, decent amount of millions. Right. Yeah. And they start feeling pretty good. You start, you know, talking, do some keynote speeches, writing some books. How I went from zero to. <laughs> You know yeah, I mean? dude, I see those all the time. That's what I mean, so like, I'm not poo pooing on them necessarily, right? I'm very happy for them. They got, the, you know, yeah, very, very cool. I'm, I'm super, like, that's the American dream, right? Mm -hmm. um, where I think it gets a little murky is, 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 is where you start attributing success to. So, right. like, Munger talks about both success and failure, treating both those imposters the same. Because there's only so much you can do. And the whole point is stacking the odds in your favor. So mm -hmm. you're trying to take bets that you can win up to the top. And what's even more important than that is the payoff. Is it worth what you're putting in? Right. So if you take enough of those bets over a long period of time, um, you'll probably do very well. Um, again, same thing with the whole mindset. Uh, right. A lot of people in that million to 10 million range, man, uh, it's not super impressive. Right. Even a little bit of it. You, you can get above that and it's still not super impressive. Like I said, not, not talking shit about it. Uh, I just feel like people should be a little more honest. Um, people focus on that, dude. When they open up a business, most of the time they're like, I just want to be, I want to make millions. It's like, I it's think like, it will get, well, I, I think, think that's like high schoolers. School. Yes. Uh, actually, I, I forget the statistic, but it's a lot that uh, they think they're going to be a millionaire by the time they think they're like 26 or something. They're going to be a lot of disappointed high schoolers. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. just like you, like, I want them all to be well. Yeah. I want them all to make money. That's, that's why people do what they do. Uh, it's a very big motive, very big incentive. Uh, but if you just look at, you look at the numbers, man, it's, it's, it's not going to Statistics. And the, I mean, there's literal data, years and years and years, that will this give you will. accurate For sure. statistics about all that yeah. stuff. So, and it doesn't lie, you know? Like, numbers don't lie. No. Statistics don't lie. So, I mean, so, so, wrapping up the business model, but so, you were just talking about the recession, you know, like inflation's all happening like that. So not to go deep into it, but like as a business owner, right? I've been telling my clients to double down during those times, if they can, um, in terms of marketing. 
specifically because everybody pulls out and it becomes extremely cheap and you can basically keep yourself alive plus coming out on top when it's all over. Um, what's your take on like your business? If like all sh like, should span, like you have, did you have reserves like to keep it up, I guess. Um, are you going to double down on the marketing? Like what do you, what, what would be a brief? We'll, we'll, we'll do a whole nother episode. Um, so, I mean, doubling down could work depending on the business and, mm -hmm. and depending on what stage that business is in. So if they're in a position where they can uh, allocate that capital in that way without harming the long-term prospects of their business or their financials, um, then yeah, that's probably a good idea. Or if maybe the business needs to just stay where they're at and that keeps them above the pack mm -hmm. of their competitors, then sure, that's, that's all they need to do. Um, some businesses might not be in the financial position to actually do that. And so, yeah, it might be in their best interest or not. But then again, it depends on what stage they're at. What if they just started their business and they don't have the capital to allocate right. that? Uh, what if they're 10 years in, they're doing well, they can, and they can potentially take more market share after a couple of competitors in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, as far as whether a recession is or is not going to happen, I don't know. Maybe, you know, maybe the feds drop the rates, maybe the fucking keep raising the rates, maybe it's like, all right, ah, maybe it's come down. I have zero, maybe. I have no fucking idea. I'm not going to pretend to have an idea. Just to speculate. Oh, dude, it's not really for me. I don't speculate. Right. You know, I, I do my best with what I know. Um, I think there are a lot of people smarter than me that also do a poor job in the Right. I think it paid a lot for it. Um, so why would I even bother trying? Mm -hmm. It's very hard to complain. Ones that, that you probably there are people that really dwell, like they dwell, yeah, they just drive you crazy, right? Like, like I feel like that's it's just unproductive to be like worrying about something that may or may not happen, especially when it stresses you out that much, right? I wouldn't make your choice based on that. Uh, that you're starting to play a very dangerous game at that point. If if your decisions are based on what's going to happen in the macro. Uh, yeah, that's true. It can work out, but it might not. Yep. Yeah. So you know, I actually want to get into that though, like on a deeper level on another on another episode of like where the economy's kind of going. I feel like I'm not the like, guy to talk like, about. Like, like I want to get into that about. of like it'd be fun to talk like about. Yes, but maybe we should find some economists on, on the episode and then just like economists. their whatever opinion. Charlie Munger has words to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> But anyways, man, it was, um, I like your perspective. It was a very thing like that. Now let's get into the whiskey. So what did you think? You can take it one more, like another taste. Um, see what you come, your last thoughts are. Man. So this is such an oaky flavored rye, but it's not like super punching in your face. Um, like a lot of the rice was like super spice oriented. This is more of just like a, like a, I don't really taste any of like fruity notes or anything like that. I think it's just really oaky smooth, um, great, great mouth coat. I think it's all around. It doesn't give you like a huge mouth, like a huge like nose bite or anything like that. I think it's pretty fucking phenomenal. What do you think? So just about everything you said. Right over my little head. <laughs> my little brain cannot handle the complexity of working this fucking time. <laughs> but what I can say is it tastes good and it's smooth. There you go. You know okay. what I mean? There you go. Like, I'm fucking pedal like finger, it. dude. Okay, like, no, that's I good. all admit it. Listen, you don't have to be an expert. You no, know, just but, like uh, it, it tastes really good. Uh, yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, drinking it neat, too, like, there's nothing yeah. crazy. Would you, would you say drinking it neat versus drinking it with a cube? Which one would you prefer? Okay. Um, I think I'm biased towards ice. Mm -hmm. So I just like it, some, I just like it a little colder. Yeah. Um, that's again a personal bias. Oh. Whether or not it's better or not, uh, I mean, maybe if you're like you or Paul that have like a better palate for this type of stuff, yeah. probably drinking it eats better because well, you can probably pick up on your nose or whatever. But you like it in general? Oh yeah, yeah. So I'll definitely drink it. Yes. Nice. For someone for someone that doesn't drink a lot of whiskey, I mean, that's good. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. So. Anyways, man, dude, thanks for being on this this week's episode, bro. It was really nice. Um, now, if you where can people find you? Um, so shout out, you know, if they're needing your service. Uh, so yeah, if they need pest control, just call Organics Pest Control. Our gals will take care of you. Our technicians are fantastic as well. Local company. Um, that's about it. You can also find some douchey stuff on 
what's it, uh, John Wick dot twenty six seventy two on Instagram and all the other channels or whatever. You go. Right on, man. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for listening, guys. Just wanted to put that out there. And this episode has been sponsored by the Rocketeer Lounge in Post Falls. Come down here, check it out. It's wonderful. I think this is the best place to hang out, kind of like smoke cigars with buddies, have business meetings, everything like that. So, all right, guys. Thanks for watching. Peace out.